Hi, everybody. Welcome to this live special event of Beyond the Trailer Park. Uh, this is a first because uh, instead of a debate or special um, sort of famous guest, we're just going to talk about philosophy for once. And joining me uh, to chit chat about uh, philosophy because I don't know shit is Dave Foda. <laughs> How's it going, Dave? Going well. How are you? Um, excellent. You're not buried in the snow yet. Uh, no, conveniently enough, we did not get the amount of precipitation right in this area that we expected to get. However, just north of me, they got upwards of six inches. Yes, and that's awesome. like same county. They got nearly six inches up there. So that's it's awesome. the the storm has created a mess. Uh, but here where I live, I'm none the worse for wear. So this is good. This is good. That's, that's a lot of snow for your neck of the woods. It is. But, uh, yeah. We're sitting at minus 13 Celsius. Yay. Yeah. And it's again. I really fucking hate winter, but anyway, I'm a shitty Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't like hockey or beer either. <laughs> no, no, I do not. And, and the tragically hip or rush. And I know Bridget. Hi. Yeah. I don't like rush. <laughs> She's going to yeah, kill me. I like that. rush too. I know you do. I don't, I can't stand Getty Lee's voice. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's see voices are hugely important to me. That's why I don't like tragically hip. I don't like Gordon Downey's voice. You know, I'm sorry. He's got cancer and all that, but I don't like listening to the man. So. Sorry. I don't believe I have ever heard anything by them. They are very, very, very Canadian. They sing like, about... Like Nickelback. Yeah, I don't like them either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Well, before we get into um, the philosophy, um, we I had mentioned a, a little while ago on Beyond the Trailer Park that we would be doing something special this evening anyway. Was supposed to be a debate, wasn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. It was. Yeah. The, this um, asshole by the name of Eric Jewell, who also goes by Wolf Bitten, um, was bragging. And, I know. He was bragging in the crazy group, and people who listen to Beyond the Trailer Park will know what we mean by the, the crazy group. Um, he was bragging in the tra crazy group that no atheist is brave enough to take me on and debate. You're all chicken. You all run away. Well, the idiot, what he was doing was saying, you debate me, and then he would insist that they debate them, like, right that second. <laughs> and And the thing is... He's a creationist, and he already has a whole cut-and-paste repertoire of bullshit that he just voiced on, because I went and watched some of his, quote, debates, and that's what he would do. It's like a bum rush, right? He'd get somebody on <laughs> completely unprepared and then throw a bunch of stupid bullshit at them and then claim that, he, you know, that proves evolution is wrong because this person who has no idea what this guy is going to say can't, quote, debunk what he said. Well, he's using pseudoscience and, you know, bullshit resources as it is. One of the links he kept using was the link created from some high school's teacher in Minnesota. And I'm like, why don't you use a real science site? But anyway, um, yeah. So I had said when he, when he was going on about everybody's too chicken, I'm like, Hey, I have my own show. Why don't you debate me? And he's like, all right, right now. And I'm like, that's not how you do it. Dumbass. <laughs> and that was before I'd even seen. And also, it was like 8 o'clock in the morning, and I, I'd been up debating some other shit head. And it was like an hour. No, it was like two hours past my bedtime. And I was like, I'm not going to debate you when I'm exhausted and I'm ready to go to bed. And he's like, oh, chicken, chicken, chicken. I'm like, oh, yeah, fuck you. So I went and made a new post. And I said, I formally challenge Eric Jewell to debate you know, on my channel, yada, yada, because I'm not going to, you know, go on his channel and, and, you know, fall prey to his bullshit. And besides, as many people know, because I say this a lot, I, can, I accept evolution. I can defend the very basics of evolution, 
but evolution has nothing to do with my atheism and when it boils down to it i really don't give a shit about it so there's no way because this is his pet thing like you know and it's really weird because he's not a young earth creationist he says that he thinks the world is older than anyone right thinks right now which is kind of lame but whatever wait, so wait, i'm wait. like wait he believes it's older than four and a half billion years oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, know that. I, it was when one of uh, when he bum rushed some poor guy who had no idea what he was getting into. He's he was going on about how the Earth is far older than anyone thinks. I'm like whatever, but that's his shtick, right? That's why he's got his repertoire of bullshit that he's going to copy pasta, and it doesn't matter what. I would say he's just going to tell me it's wrong because that's what he did on all his other thing. And he had, there was another debate where he's, it, it was like, you know, uh, Eric Jewell destroys the, theolo theology scholar. That's what it was. And so he has this woman come on and he has her state her credentials. She had multiple degrees, had studied theology for like 30 years. And whenever she would say, well, so-and-so, this, you know, this person um, in this work said such and such, he would say, what's your proof? And I'm like, she's <laughs> sources, <laughs> right? And at one point, yeah. she actually cited a primary source, and he's like, what's your proof? And so I'm like, there's no way I'm getting into this. So I didn't care what the topic was, but I was not going to debate evolution with him. That was for damn sure. So he comes out with... You know, he, he's like, um, pick your topic and such, but I want you to agree to certain, he wanted me to agree that it would be live, which is fine, that's what I wanted, and he wanted to agree it would be unedited, which would have been my requirement to him, right? So he didn't require anything that I objected to, and he said, pick a topic. So I did. I picked the topic of, um, of evidence the concept of evidence because he obviously has a major problem with it <laughs> <laughs> and and i asked dave here to moderate you know which was great and dave you know very kindly accepted to moderate and so we started a a, a three-way private message chat with eric and when i said you know we decided on today as the date and then he wouldn't pick a time and i had said oh there was something about um david put time limits on how long we were going to speak and when he's like well i don't like that and that's why he didn't pick a time to do it and i was like look i don't care you know we can be flexible on that and i said but the topic the, is the, the upshot of that is that he didn't want to be limited to prevent him from doing any gish gallops <laughs> <laughs> exactly but we were going to put right in the rules that gish gallops aren't allowed anyway but anyway um he he vehemently objected to my topic of the concept of evidence he's like you know i'd rather d uh talk about why atheists believe in fairy rocks or something and use evidence to debate that i'm like no i don't debate fairy rocks sorry and <laughs> he just would not do it and then he started saying that Oh, but he had to agree to the topic. And I'm like, you just said, pick a topic. You didn't say, and I'll agree on it or anything else. You told me to pick a topic. Here's a fucking topic. And then he bitched and moaned and whined and said that we were dishonest and <laughs> all the other bullshit. And basically he rage quit. So, um, fuck you, Eric. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no one i'm certainly not afraid to debate you in any way shape or form um i'm just not going to let you pull your stupid tricks because that's not a debate right when you tell so oh and and in our chat remember he wanted he's like well dave's here and you're here we're gonna do it now and i'm like no we're not we're <laughs> well we didn't agree to this that and the other thing so i don't agree to the i'm just like whatever you fucking idiot so and he doesn't he doesn't understand what a debate actually is no he thinks a debate is when he gets someone on his channel that he can run roughshod over present whatever he wants and declare everything else that person says is stupid and then say he won that's what he thinks the debate is so 
yeah. So Eric is doing whatever fucking jerk off thing he's does on a Saturday night. I don't know what, but he's not here because he's a giant pussy. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you, you said um, it, sister. Ah, I can't fucking stand it. He's going around calling everyone else a pussy. That's because he's the pussy. Yep. Right. That's exactly it. And that's why I called him on it. That's why I was like, I have a channel. Come on my channel. And I kept saying, if you're so good at debating, why does it matter what the topic is? But he was only interested in either debating scripture or evolution because that's what he had the copy pasta for. And I'm like, mm -hmm. sorry, hope you don't play that game. <laughs> oh, fuck. Okay. So philosophy. So I know absolutely, well, not absolutely, but very little about philosophy. I've never studied it. Um, I, I know who a few philosophers are. Um, some of them, if people mention them, I don't even know who they are. And so a few nights ago, Foda had posted something about philosophy and philosophy students. And then he said that one of the only um, philosophy concepts that he finds really interesting was the ship of Theseus. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? So I go and look it up, and I'm like, huh, that is kind of cool. So why don't we start with you giving a basic idea of what the ship of Theseus is? Because I'm not sure I can do it justice. Um, and, well, I'm just going to go with uh, Plutarch here, uh, where he talks about it. He says, the ship wherein Theseus and the youth of Athens returned from Crete had 30 oars and was preserved by the Athenians down even to the time of Demetrius uh, Phalerius. For they took away the old planks as they decayed, putting in new and stronger timber in their places, insomuch that this ship became a standing example among the philosophers. For the logical question of things that grow, one side holding that the ship remained the same, and the other contending that it was not the same. Basically what he's what he's talking about here is if you take an original ship, uh, the original masts, the original oars, the original uh, planks and decking and, and everything else, and slowly replace each piece and each fastener one by one until, uh, until such time that none of the original pieces remain. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the ship, is it still the same ship? Yeah. And Plutarch was saying that, well, this one group of philosophers says that it is the same ship. And this other group of philosophers says, well, no, it's not the same ship. Right. And basically the, the difference is boils down to, uh, it's not the formal cause. And uh, give me just a second. I'm going to have to look here. Uh, okay. Aristotle said that there were, um, four particular causes uh, of any object. There was a, a formal cause, a material cause, a final cause, and an efficient cause. Uh, formal cause is the object's form. Uh, like it is in the form of this big boat. So right. that's the formal cause. The material cause, <clears throat> excuse me, the material cause is the matter or the the parts and pieces of which the thing is made so you have you can basically look at it as two competing causes when you when you try and apply those to okay. the ship of theseus okay. the group of philosophers that said that it was the same ship uh, were more concerned with the formal cause the form that the ship takes the ones that said that it was not the same ship were the ones who paid more attention to the material cause the okay. individual parts and pieces from which the ship was made okay because that makes a little more sense to me because when i first read it and and i tend to be very practical in my reasoning and i thought to myself okay you replace a plank here and there, it's still the same ship. But when you get to the point that you replace all, well, no, because we don't even know the Theseus ever even set foot on that ship. So that's obviously <laughs> not the same ship. 
and and so that's that's how i viewed it so the idea of the form you know because yes it looks exactly like theseus ship but as far as the tactile actual pieces it's definitely not so to me it was a very clear-cut thing so i'm like why is anybody you know spending centuries mulling over this but that's me and my very practical reasons <laughs> well well first of all the the reason that it's called the ship of theseus is because that's the example that plutarch was using that just happened to be uh, right that the athenians had taken apart piece by piece and preserved all of it so that's right that's kind of what because i read there was a version with a hammer or an axe or something and i'm like okay well if you've replaced the handle at some point and then you replace the head at some point it's definitely a different axe no way around it to me that was that was another example but when you talk people don't have a tendency to name to give uh proper names to their woodworking tools <laughs> true but they do give proper names to ships Right. So if, uh, like, um, the Microsoft executive with the huge ass yacht, oh, uh, that, has, that has several smaller yachts orbiting it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember his name. It's not. It's not Bill Gates. It's the oh, um, the bald guy. Um, the I one think who. I think it's Steve one. something, but. Steve, uh, no, that's, you're thinking, are you thinking Steve Jobs? No. No. Anyway. Uh, I should know because I used to work for Microsoft. Oh, bad ex-employee. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, he's got this gigantic ass yacht and I think it, I think it has a 10,000 foot long runway on it for Boeing 747s. Okay, but, uh, uh, but of course that ship has a name. Right. Um, so if you take if you're the main point the main point is what is a ship that's how you have to look at it is it a collection of these parts and pieces mm -hmm. or is it the idea the idea of the thing if it's the mm -hmm. idea of the thing then you're looking at a formal cause if it's the parts and pieces then you're looking at the material cause Right. So again, from the way I view that sort of thing, because as you know, I'm a history nerd and I'm an antiques buff. So when I think of, you know, this is, um, say, um, well, for instance, Queen Elizabeth the First's corset exists. And so something that's fabric is fairly delicate. So to me, the thing that exists right now that actually was used on Queen Elizabeth, that's hers, that's personal, you know, she sweat into it, whatever. But if they ended up having to replace all the fabric and maybe the boning over time or whatever, to me, that is no longer Queen Elizabeth's corset because she never touched those materials. It's a replica of Queen Elizabeth's corset. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It does absolutely. I view those things. But here again, she didn't name her corset Lucy. No. So all you have when you discuss Queen Elizabeth's corset is a material cause. Right. When you're talking about, uh, when you're talking about, you're either talking about the materials that go into it or the idea of what it is. So I have another Tudor example. Um, Henry VIII shipped the Mary Rose. It was his I flag. Really <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I know you hate that song. I do hate that song. <laughs> Check out my wall. You'll see how much he hates that song. But anyway, um, <laughs> he had a ship called the Mary Rose, which was his flagship. And it was sunk in a battle and and i don't recall the exact year but he died in 1547 so probably somewhere in the 1530s 40s whatever it doesn't really matter but the ship sunk and they found the mary rose this the one that sunk in, mm -hmm. in the ocean and it was raised and preserved and whatnot but there is a, a from 
you know, finding the actual ship, they built a replica called the Mary Rose that looks as identical to the one they found in the bottom of the ocean as they could possibly get with the information they had. So which one of those is the Mary Rose? <laughs> well, in that case, you've already acknowledged that they took new objects, new fasteners, new nails, new wood, and built yeah. a replica from it. So there yeah. was never any point in time when any of those uh, parts and pieces were part of the original Mary Rose. So in that case, even though they named the boat the Mary That's Rose, where I'm going. I, mean, yeah. hell, I know three or four Franks, they're not made of the same atoms. <laughs> Very true. So when you I when know you, a fuckload of Dave's and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> so you know when you look at it that <clears throat> excuse me, when you look at it that way, the one that they built uh, the one that they built after finding the original Mary Rose is very obviously a replica. They may call it the Mary Rose, but it is not the Mary Rose, the Mary Rose of Henry VIII. Right. So there is a particular, there is a particular idea about the original ship, the Mary Rose that belonged to Henry VIII. But now what if they did the whole, um, you know, replacing it piece by piece. And, and I read also that some people brought up the idea, well, what if you replace the ship piece by piece until, you know, all of the new, it's all new. And then you take all of the old bits that you replaced from and built another ship out of the old pieces. Now, what do you have? <laughs> you have a, you have a reconditioned ship, but here, right. here what well, here, here's another way of looking at it. Okay. You, every cell in your body or your body replaces every single one of its cells approximately every seven years. Yeah. Every I didn't seven know. years, every seven years, are you a different person? No, no, well, you're not. Depends what happens in those seven years. We're, no, we're not talking about if we're not talking about life events here. Okay. Okay. Now physically I'm the same person. Yes. Yeah. So even though you don't have any of those original cells after the time that you're seven years old, are you still the same person? Well, yeah, yeah. you are because, because the thing is the formal cause makes more sense when you're speaking about a specific, uh, a specific object with its own history. Uh, perhaps a person with their own ideas and their own emotions or um, uh, an object that has a rare object or, you know, a one of a kind piece of craftsmanship or something like that. In that case, the formal cause is more important than the material cause. Okay. Because it's more about the, it's more about how you think of the object than it is the object's materials. Okay. So for instance, someone who had served on Theseus ship who went on leave and came back, even though maybe in that time they replaced the very last plank and it was all now new, he would still look at that and go, Oh, that's my ship. Yes, exactly. Okay. That's precisely how it works. Because the ship of Theseus has a particular set of uh, a particular history about it. Um, people think about it in particular ways. Mm -hmm. Just like the Mary Rose. Right. Right. But they didn't have anywhere near enough of the Mary Rose to do a piece by piece. So right. that's why I just Wait. started over. <laughs> Here's another way of here's another way of considering it. Let I'm going to ask you this: Define a river. What is a river? It is a body of water that flows between two pieces of land. Okay. 
And anything else? Anything else you want to add to that? It will have a beginning at some body of water, and it will have an end at some body of water. Okay. So you said that it is a body of water. What constitutes that body of water specifically? Um, it has banks on each side, and there's a bottom. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the water itself. Oh, well, it's H2O. Okay. So um, some of it comes from rain. Some of it might come from underground. It depends on where the river is. Okay. So the river is a body of water that moves mm -hmm. and has sides, barriers of land on either side. Well, when you're talking about the Nile, the water that's in that river is going to change every second. Yes. So is it still the Nile? Is it still the Nile River? Yeah. And that's actually something I've thought about as a kid was, you know, if I if I'm in the lake, because we used to swim in the Great Lakes, you know, if I go to the lake this summer, I will, you know, I will never again touch the water that I'm touching right now because it's going to go back out into the lake and who knows where it's going to go. Right. Yeah. But it's still, you know, Lake Huron. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's still located in the same place. It still yeah. has the same borders around it, even though the, even though there's going to be erosion along the shoreline, you know, but it's still generally the same thing and it has a name. Yes. It has a particular meaning for, it has a particular meaning for people like Henry the eighth ship. It had a particular meaning for Henry yes. the eighth. Uh, the name, the Nile river has a particular meaning. For a lot of people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah. what, Basically, what Plutarch was describing wasn't whether or not it was the same ship, whether whether or not the ship of Theseus was the same ship, if every if every piece had been replaced. What he was demonstrating was that there is a difference between there is a distinct difference between what something is made of and how we see it, how we think about it, how we uh, how we consider it in our minds. Right. So you could expand that to something like um, more mundane things where, for instance, you know, a fork is a fork, whether it's made of plastic or sterling silver or steel or. Whatever. Exactly. Right. Because because what what you're looking at, what you're looking at there is the formal cause, not the material cause. Now. Right. If you were to, given the fact that most forks only have one material component, which is the metal or the plastic that's in the fork, you couldn't very well sit here and say, um, this is my fork, and then down the road have to get rid of it and get one made of a different material and now say, this is my fork. Well, of course, yeah. of course that's your fork, but it's not the same fork yes yes because it's we it's not a, a singular item everybody tends to have a bunch of them and exactly and no yeah. one and no one really assigns meaning or history to an fork. eating utensil Yes, at least Most, not in the century. Yes. In, in the Middle Ages, possibly, yes, but not now. Because back then, you might have only ever had one fork that you had to carry with you everywhere. But that's... True. Oh, yeah. So, right, I can see that. And, you know, you can kind of expand that now into the digital age because our information is so portable so you may have, you know, my computer, but your computer changes fairly regularly, but your data will transfer from computer to computer to computer. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I have, 
I have a, a, a drive now that I've had for oh, at least over a decade. And I've cloned it several times and moved it to different machines, but it still has the same basic parameters in it, the same file structure and the same information for the most part. Mm -hmm. And none of that data is actually material in nature. All of right. it is nothing more than how the computer reads a, a binary series of zeros and ones. So there's yeah. no material to that data, but that data does have meaning for the yes. person who looks at it. Like, like photos, and my original Napster files from 1998. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I I have some Napster files from 1998. I do. Back when I it took a week and a half to download a song. <laughs> I am probably the only tech out there who has never used Napster. Mm. I'm not even a tech, man. But yeah, try downloading music on a 56K modem. <laughs> I have. Not fun. I've done, I've done it on a 33.6 modem. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, a week for one fucking song, man. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ay, times are so much better now. I can stream something. You know, we stream something instantaneously nowadays. But anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. So now the other part of this, you had mentioned um, sort of consciousness playing into this. How does right that... the the unity of consciousness? Um. And we have to go with Descartes here. Uh, in one of his works, and I don't remember which one it is, he says, when I consider the mind, that is to say myself in as much as I am only a thinking thing, I cannot distinguish myself. I cannot distinguish in myself any parts, but apprehend myself to be clearly one and entire. And what he's saying here is he's going with the formal cause. Even though he doesn't understand or perhaps even know about all of his individual organs, I doubt he knew what his spleen was or his appendix was. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he may not understand how these organs work. He may not understand what goes into them. Uh, he may not understand the internal causes uh, of how they can fail. Uh, he may not understand the, the, the fatty, the fatty material that is his brain. But when he looks at it, when he looks at himself, he looks at the whole of himself. He doesn't, he doesn't pick away any particular parts. If he had to have his gallbladder removed, I mean, that's the thing that you're taking out and you're not replacing it. Right. But is he still the same person? Well, of course he is because, yeah. because of that, that whole formal cause. It's right. the form of something, the idea of something, it's history, it's emotion. Right. But now when you get into things like the brain and we've heard this where someone has suffered a traumatic brain injury and people will say they're not the same person anymore. So, but, but what, but what are they saying? What, what are they actually saying when they do that? that their personality has changed and they aren't relating ah. to them in the way that they're used to. Ah, yes. But has that person's history changed? Has the, has the experience, have, has that person's experiences changed? Um, wow. Has the level of emotion that someone else feels for that person changed at all it could but at that point usually not right so when somebody says and, and you said it very well when somebody says they're not the same person that i once knew what they're actually saying is their personality has changed or their behavior has changed their mannerisms have changed mm -hmm. and i don't react and i don't uh, converse or react with, I don't converse with or react to them in familiar ways anymore. 
Right. But they're actually not saying that they're not the same person. Right. They're saying that they recognize a change in personality or behavior. So, but then that per the person saying that, you know, my loved one isn't the same person, they may argue that the change in personality is so drastic that they would actually state, no, they really aren't the same person anymore. I can certainly see how that's possible. Yeah. Um, but even then, I have a difficult time with that line of thinking mm -hmm. because because <clears throat> because to me they're still saying there has been a change in this person but they're still referring to that person by the name that they know them by true true true, true. they're still uh if they live together they're probably still living together mm -hmm. even after some kind of a catastrophic event so they're not really they're not really saying that the person is different they're saying that there is something about the person that is different okay yeah i can see that so they're the im because the impact to them is so great they're it's almost like they're being hyperbolic without meaning to be yeah, basically. Okay. Okay. I can see that. But now what if we get to the extreme of somebody who has total amnesia and so they don't recognize anyone or anything to them. They don't have a past. They don't know anything other than the, what's going forward. But no, but they do still have a past and they do still have experiences that they have amnesia doesn't change. Okay. What they have had in the past, what they've done in the past, who they've loved in the past. It just means once again, that there has been a change in something about the person. Right. Re amnesia. But it okay. doesn't mean that the person is any different. It doesn't mean that it's a completely different person. Because the people who shared the past with them are there to validate the past that occurred. Mm -hmm. And hopefully coach them back to a point where they can begin to remember things. Right. The, uh, I don't know if you or any of the audience members watched the show Blind Spot. Um, huh. But that, uh, I was, I didn't think that it was going to be as good a show as it is, but we're now in season two, you know, it was, it was renewed for a second season and I hope it gets renewed for a third at least. Uh, but the premise of the show is that you have, uh, this woman who used to be, uh, had military special forces training and was part of a group uh, that's known uh, to the FBI as Sandstorm. Okay. She, <clears throat> they did a chemical wipe on her brain, Ooh. tattooed her body, and stuck her in a bag in the middle of Times Square ah. in, the hope, in the hopes that she would eventually become a part of an FBI team so that she could begin to filter information about the FBI and its operations back to Sandstorm. Well, that, that hasn't happened. And in right. fact, doing that chemical wipe on her brain, once she has, uh, once she makes contact with the FBI and, you know, once she begins to interact with the people within the FBI, then she is, uh, then, the original views that she had as a member of Sandstorm are no mm -hmm. longer there. Now she is more interested in the health and welfare of her FBI teammates and in bringing down Sandstorm. <laughs> but yes. has she changed? Well, there's a part of her that's changed. Her attitudes have changed. Her memories 
are gone and she's had to make new ones. Now she does recognize a few things here and there from her past, right. but has she, is she a completely different person? No, well, she's not. It's like, you can kind of liking it to, um, when we change from being a theist to an atheist, that's a huge shift in, in philosophy and in yes. outlook and, and all of that we're still the same people and in fact we spend a lot of time convincing family and friends that we're still the same people <laughs> yes we do <laughs> <laughs> yeah we haven't sprouted horns or any of that <clears throat> um so yeah i can kind of see it in that context exactly it's essentially the same thing we just don't have but when but when you move from theism to atheism, you don't lose any of those past memories. You depend on them yes. because that helps you to be an atheist. <laughs> Absolutely fucking right. <laughs> Especially when you got made to go to church and all that bullshit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So yeah. Okay. I can see that it's because I wasn't sure, like just from reading the, the stuff about the material items, the ship, I'm like, what does consciousness have to do with all of that? But that makes a lot more sense. Pluto, Plutarch's, uh, Plutarch's passage that we read earlier where he was talking about, is it the same ship or not? What he's really asking is, well, he's not really asking anything. What he's trying to describe is how and whether we assign any particular meaning to okay. objects okay you know if we do assign meaning to them then we're geared to look more at formal at the formal cause of the object right it is, it is the thing that we know that we recognize that we uh that we consider as something more than just its individual parts and pieces. Well, and that brings me back to my time in the antiques business, because you could get a thing. Um, well, for instance, what popped into my head was um, a large traveling steamer trunk. And I mean, it was beautifully made. It was, you know, covered in leather and wonderful interior with a linen thing and all of that. It was obviously owned by a wealthy person and a high quality item. Mm -hmm. But what made it special is the monogram on it proved it had been owned by Maria Fedorovna, the mother of Tsar Nicholas II. Wow. So, Yes, I got to touch it and clean it and stuff. It's really cool. Nice. Uh, I even have a picture of me standing next to it. So, and I mean, this is one of, they figure probably, well, it was numbered. I think it was piece 148 of her luggage. Like, it's, and it was a fucking huge chest. Jesus but, Christ. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, to look at, it, if it wasn't for the monogram, you'd look at it and go, wow, that's a really high quality piece of, of, you know, antique travel furniture. Like, basically, it was travel furniture, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it would have had a, a, a decent bit of value and all of that. But you slap that crest on it with a provenance because it came from her daughter, her daughter, the Grand Duchess Olga, who emigrated to Canada after World War One and died in Canada. So we knew, like, somebody didn't just carve a thing and put it on there. We knew it belonged to the to the the Tsarina Maria Fedorovna. Mm -hmm. That was just, you know, and so that upped its value astronomically. Yeah, naturally. It, yeah. So it's the same kind of thing. Like, it, it was a very nice, high-quality piece, but you add that to it and it's like, whoa, you're mm -hmm. touching something that, you know, a royal person, a famous person touched. And I, I personally get, got a lot of, um, I guess, satisfaction out of things like that, where, you know, if you got something in that we knew was owned by a famous person, it was like, ooh, that's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. So, 
but otherwise, you know, like if it was a, a plate, you know, we, we had uh, plates with the monogram of the Duke of Wellington. So they actually belong to the service of the Duke of Wellington, which is really, really cool too. But otherwise it's just a really pretty plate. Right. So that, that's where my mind goes. Mm -hmm. Well, here, <clears throat> excuse me, here's another thing to consider. You know those cartoons with Jesus trying to clap a fly? <laughs> yes. And the fly goes away. Well, he's got holes in his hands, right? There's yep. there's a big section of his hand that's missing. Yes. So part of the material of Jesus has been taken away. Yes. Right? But is it still Jesus? Well, yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Because he's... because we have assigned some meaning to that concept of what Jesus is, just like we assign meaning to the Titanic or to the Mary Rose, just like we assign uh, meaning to, well, I'll give you, I'll give you another example, very simplistic and, and it's a seasonal example. <clears throat> uh, my mother and late father had this lighted star that okay. would top the Christmas tree every year. Right. And the, the lights in it were yellow. And that to me really said Christmas. Yes, I can see that. Um, and once my mother passes, I will get that star. Now I have another lighted star that I put on the top of my tree. But I, but I will be getting that star and that star has functioned without fail and without burning out any bulbs. Wow. For when did they get married? Forty six years. Cool. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, so I will be getting that star. If a bulb burns out, I'll have to replace it. If the foil backing on it gets somehow damaged, I'll have to replace that. The webbing on the front of it, the gold webbing that's on the front of it, if that goes out, I'll have to replace it. But is it the same Christmas star that was part of my history? Yes. It is still that same Christmas star because of what it means to me. Yes. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. It's like, woo. <laughs> like I said, I never studied this stuff, so this is all kind of new to me. And Well, the, the you said something earlier, and I wanted to circle back around to it. Sure. Um about the post that I had on my page about philosophy and philosophy students. I, <clears throat> I don't particularly have any issue with philosophy itself. Uh, part of science is philosophy and philosophy can help us to ask the right questions and guide us on the proper paths uh, for getting reasonable and appropriate answers. Right. But when it comes to getting those answers, that's done through experimentation, not yes. philosophy. Yes. And what I see a lot of particularly philosophy students do <clears throat> is when you say, well, this conclusion is true. They will argue and try and use philosophy to do it. Well, maybe uh, this conclusion is not true because maybe this word in your conclusion means something different than what it means. And uh, there's all kinds of, that's bullshit. Drives me crazy. That there is philosophy for the sake of philosophy is fucking stupid. Yes, I agree. Uh, I totally agree. It drives me batty when, especially when you're trying to debate something and you want evidence and they throw philosophy at you as fucking evidence and like 
I don't give a fuck what some guy said 3,000 years ago. I really don't. It has nothing to do with today. <laughs> like, I always thought, and maybe maybe my way of thinking about it is wrong, but I always thought of philosophy as speculation on steroids. <laughs> uh, I No, I don't even think it's on steroids. I think it's just speculation. speculation. Yeah. You know, it's, like, well, look at look at it this way we go right back to, to, uh, to Plutarch's passage uh, when he's talking about the ship of Theseus. He's talking about whether or not the ship is the same if everything has been removed. Yeah. But he's not, what he's not saying is the actual issue, whether or not we're assigning meaning to it. So with the philosophy, he's describing these, he's describing these different camps mm -hmm. that have different uh, yeah, that have different ideas as to whether or not it's the same ship, but he's not actually saying both of these guys don't fucking get it. It's just about whether or not we assign meaning to it. Plutarch never said that. Right. So what we have is a passage that is literally nothing more than navel gazing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, a lot of stuff that um, philosophy talks about and thinks about has use and and like mm -hmm. you said has given direction and it, to me it's sort of the beginning of where people formulate hypotheses that then they can go and test exactly right it's it's the beginning point but it's not anything that you can use to to prove or demonstrate anything it's just a hey what if huh have you thought about it this way before which is great but it it has no place in the arena of of evidence and proof whatsoever the biggest problem is that philosophy is not binary Yes. But philosophy students tend to think that it does satisfy the requirements to be included in binary experimentation. That's bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it drives me fucking nuts when I'm having a discussion about something um, and tends to be religion because let's face it, that's what I talk about a lot. Yeah. And, you know, they'll, they'll uh, throw in some kind of, uh, you know, I'll make a point that I know is has been established and I know that there's, you know, evidence to support and whatnot. And they'll come up with some like, well, blah, blah, theory says blah, blah, blah. And that means that you're wrong. And I'm like, on what fucking planet? <laughs> <laughs> like, just, just don't. <laughs> like, don't even comment on that shit in that way. Like maybe say hey you know such and such philosopher thought of it in this way or that manner okay but don't fucking tell me i'm wrong because some dead guy from a thousand years ago said something like no <laughs> yeah he has he may have uh he may have a particular skill set particular training in an area but unless he is an unless you are commenting on a on a specific field or a specific element for which that philosopher is the absolute authority on he has no more credibility to comment on it than you do exactly and i would never get into a discussion like that because i don't know enough about philosophers <laughs> well yeah. i have i have taken a couple of very basic philosophy courses, but I never, but I never studied it formally. It's not necessary to study philosophy no. uh, formally unless you are going to be the next generation Aristotle or a college professor. Other than that, it's absolutely useless in the real world. Now, I will say I do know um, a very excellent philosophy professor from local area here, Mr. Chris DiCarlo. And what makes him awesome is he focuses on critical thinking mm -hmm. more so than the philosophy. And what mm -hmm. really makes him awesome is that he's gotten our government to institute a critical thinking curriculum into our high schools in my wow. house. Oh yes. God, I want to move to Canada. 
you would love this man. He's wonderful. Um, I've, he has a book out, How to Be a Really Good Pain in the Ass. <laughs> <laughs> It was great when, when I bought my copy, uh, uh, Chris was busy talking to someone else and his wife, Linda, was there and I said, I need a really good pain in the ass. And she looks over, she goes, he's free. <laughs> <laughs> but they're wonderful people. But this this is a wonderful achievement that he's done. And so, yes, he is a philosophy professor, but he's also an ethics and critical thinking professor. Mm -hmm. And what he's done is, is phenomenal. Yeah. And he, done that because he's branched out from the philosophy mm -hmm. and broadened his, well, his interests. If, if he's more interested in the critical thinking side and, and particularly ethics, it tells me that he probably understands the limit of philosophy. I think he does. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's somebody I would probably like to meet. Yes, him, you would. Him and I don't even know if I don't even know if this guy's still alive anymore. Charles Pierce, he's an American philosopher. Mm -hmm. He's the one. He's the one that uh, when you talk about the the different forms of logic, mm -hmm. there's deductive logic. There, well, I'm sorry, not the different forms of logic, the different forms of reasoning, <clears throat> because logic and reasoning are two are two subtly different things. Um, there's deductive reasoning, there's inductive reasoning, and there's abductive reasoning. And deductive reasoning basically doesn't give you anything in the conclusion that wasn't already present in the premises. Right. Inductive reasoning is something that Hume complains about, and I have dis and I have a distinct disagreement with Hume on on the substance of. Uh, his problem of induction, but I get why he said it. Okay. Um, and it's, I think he was actually joking mm -hmm. when it comes right down to it. Uh, but then there's also abductive reasoning and abductive reasoning is that thing that Charles Pierce calls guessing <laughs> because there is no reasoning behind it. Right. You know, you're well, I take that back. There are reasons behind it. There's not really any skepticism behind it, though. There's no uh, there's no careful consideration of cause and effect when it comes to abductive reasoning. That makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think you would enjoy uh, Chris. I have to see. He spoke at the non-con this year which I had to miss for the fucking stupid wedding. Um, but I will see if there's any video out available of, of his talk because he gives excellent talks. And he probably was speaking uh, about his um, curriculum for critical thinking, which is based on his book. So it's kind of like he's taken his book and turned it into a curriculum for high school students, which is nice. Awesome. I saw him speak, um, it was uh, about a year ago in the fall, when he was, the curriculum had been launched as a, a pilot project, and it had just been accepted um, school board wide, and so he gave a talk um, that I went to go see, and it was, uh, a lot of teachers were there too, uh, that were supportive and whatnot, but um he was saying then that he is being approached by other countries, expressly China. He had been approached by China to. But um, he's not being approached by the United States. Yeah, funny that. Ugh. <laughs> you know, but even yeah. even if it, even if his program did make it into some of the public schools here, they mm -hmm. would never make it into the southeastern United States. Yeah, they would freak from if you take a if you take a counterclockwise swing beginning at Texas <clears throat> and you expand that swing like that, yeah, you would eventually wind up in Virginia and West Virginia oh. and everything contained in that area would never approve that curriculum. 
Yeah. Well, the thing is, is uh, once the government said, hey, we like this, it was like, yeah, you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like about that. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's really exciting that, and I remember the very first non-con, which was three years ago now, he was there as well, and he said that he was going to introduce it. So it took him three years to get it made um, part of the full curriculum in the entire province. Wow. That's pretty damn good. But he did it. He did it. Absolutely. That's like, I, to me, that's a really short time frame. So, yeah. He's the, quite the fella. Now, one of these days, uh, he'll ha uh, hopefully he'll go down there somewhere and, and you can meet him. Because he's a lot of fun. I, uh, I was able to go to the dinner at the non-con. And uh, he and Armin Navabi of uh, Atheist Republic uh, sat at my table. So when you, I mean, Armin is such a fun loving guy anyway, and he, he thinks a lot and comes up with some stuff. So the, uh, the topic of dinner um, at the table with Chris DiCarlo and Armin Navabi spouses and uh, some other local folks was, is necrophilia morally wrong? <laughs> Uh, that that was the topic. I didn't even of want to consider that idea. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was an interesting discussion, I have to say. Um, we decided no that it <sighs> isn't wrong, but <laughs> that's what happens well, when you have dinner with a philosophy professor, man. But it was Armin that came up with the topic. <laughs> wow, I can't. You know, I do a lot of thinking, as you well know, but that's, wow. I've no, actually had somebody no. ask, ask me that, not quite in that way, but something similar before. So it, I had actually thought of it before, not in my own, but because somebody had asked me something similar previously. So. <laughs> you know, now I'm going to have to start thinking about that because... <clears throat> Because that does kind of play into a a ship of thesis or a ship of Theseus type dilemma. Ooh, it does. I hadn't thought of that. Ah. Damn you, Deborah. Is that <laughs> sorry? <laughs> but it does. It's like, is that the same person now? And do they qualify as person in the same? Ooh. See, we, we decided that they were now an inanimate object, so it didn't matter at that point. So, I... You that, think it over. <laughs> it's, I will admit that the, the thought of me thinking about this is a definite turnoff. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but the concept is so the concept itself is rather fascinating. It I is. have to admit it's rather fascinating. Is it morally wrong? Well, I'm not even sure the correct I'm not even sure the correct question is is it morally wrong? I think the correct question might be is it ethically wrong? Yes, that could be too. Uh, because uh, the word morals and the word ethics are often used interchangeably, but they do have subtle differences. They are subtle so, differences. <laughs> shit. Now I'm going to so, be awake all goddamn night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it's almost time to end the show, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, You're um, I, we, In private. In preparation for the storm, uh, went ahead and you know, uh, neighbor girl did the groceries this week on Thursday instead of Friday, and you know made sure the the cars were gassed up in case we did lose power. And so I also have and I also have some company this weekend. Um, we are still likely to be uh, to be shut down Monday. 
yes. probably most of the day Monday because of the way that our weather systems work. Mm -hmm. And I have been saying this over and over. Uh, most people who experience, who have, who have frequent winter weather experiences, most of that is due to snow. Right. Spend a winter down in the southeastern U.S. when we have bad weather events, and you and will no longer think that we're just in uh, idiotic rednecks who wreck our cars all the time. We actually do this a hell of a lot better than you think we do. It's the fact that our precipitation is so much different from yeah. everybody else's that causes the problems. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, we don't get a whole lot of ice. We get a, sh a shit ton of snow. Like mm -hmm. we might get, we might get a foot and a half overnight. Mm -hmm. But see, down here, when we've had big snows, I can remember uh, when my family first moved to Charlotte uh, in 78. I think it was the very next year or maybe it was that year in uh, it was in March. We had a snowfall here where we got down here in North Carolina and South Carolina. We got a foot of snow. Damn. But we don't have any more problem getting around in snow than anyone else does. Yeah. The main thing we get is fucking ice. And I don't care how good you are at getting around in snow. Ice is ice. It Nobody is. has any advantages when it comes to ice. Oh, hell no. No, I don't even want to go out if it's icy. Fuck that. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, we should wrap this up because I got another show to do in less than an hour. Woo. Yeah, actually, you do. You do. Say hi to, say to, hi to uh, Shujin and everybody for me. I sure will. Well, thank you for uh, coming out and doing this. Uh, it wasn't what sure. we planned, but I think it was informative and I learned a few things because, like I said, uh, I pretty much don't know anything about philosophy. So, and I know even though you said you had formally studied it, you, you read every fucking thing that you can get your hands on. <laughs> I do. <laughs> you do. So it's kind of like, you know, I like me, I have not studied history really formally since university but i've been reading it you know for decades since so 20 years since so well, same. In, that, in that case the next time you do one of these uh special saturday night shows we'll talk about noah's flood because i have done oh. i have done a considerable blah, 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 blah. <laughs> this is my first class i'm not drunk i'm just I overly tired um i have uh once i started reading i reading isaac asimov's the history of the was it the history of the bible okay i believe that's the title i have it upstairs i don't have it in front of me once i started reading that i became fascinated uh particularly with his take on uh, on Noah and on Abraham. And then I started looking at uh, climactic and geographical events in the area of Anatolia and the Levant and where these different cities were located. And I started to see a particular sequence. And I have an idea about how the, the myth of Noah's flood actually came to be and not only how it came to be, but how it was carried from place to place to place. That sounds fascinating. We will so, definitely have to talk about that then. Next time you want to do one of these and talk to me and I'll, uh, I'll come on. <laughs> Can't say any of it's based in absolute fact other than right. the events happening themselves. Right. Uh, but I think I can make a pretty solid case for it. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Sounds good. We'll definitely have to do that soon then. Well, again, thanks for uh, spending some time tonight. Uh, I know you got stuff going on and whatnot, but uh, it was fun and I enjoyed it. And, uh, I did too. Thanks for having me. 
you're very welcome. So uh, we'll close out the show with yourself. <laughs> of course. <laughs> like we always do. I swear, one of these days I will make you read it live. <laughs> no, you won't. Well, I might. I might oh, consider you, doing that. You'd do it for me. I know you would. <laughs> So uh, we'll see everybody on Monday as usual, and uh, you'll be seeing me on Holy Crap in uh, less than an hour, 12.05, and it's 11.18 now, so very soon. So pop on over to Holy Crap the Vlogcast, and uh, you'll be uh, listening to me and the crap crew very shortly. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> yeah, there was a, a listener that dubbed us the crap crew a while back. So we just kind of went with it. <laughs> hey, you've assigned some meaning to it. So even uh, if one of the, so even if the people change out, it's still the same crew. It's the crap crew. You got it. All right, folks, we'll see you soon. And uh, you can listen to uh, Dave and his uh, only creed for humankind. And we'll uh, be back. Uh, we'll do one of these again soon. So good night, folks. Good night. I know the truth and power of reason and of rational thinking, and I will use them to my advantage. I know the truth and power of educating myself and of expanding my intellectual boundaries and I will educate myself. I know the truth and power of vanquishing ignorance, and I will do so whenever the opportunity presents itself. I know the truth and power of morality without supervision, and of true and accurate righteousness. I know the truth and power of obliterating tyranny, be it intellectual, emotional, or philosophical and will work toward that goal whenever and however possible. I know the truth and power of human ingenuity. I know the truth and power of human compassion, and I will be mindful of the welfare of others. I know the truth and power of equality and fairness for all living things. I know the truth and power of the importance of our families, our friends, and our fellow men and women. I know the truth and power of human stewardship of our lands, our waters, and our skies, and I will try to act to preserve our environment. I know the truth and power of the sciences of mathematics, of physics, and of chemistry, and of the important role of these disciplines in understanding the workings of this cosmos. I know the truth and power of the rejection of all notions or beliefs that reside in the supernatural or the superstitious, and of those notions or beliefs that we are not supposed to be able to explain. And I know that these rejections are necessary for humankind's survival. I am a human being with a free mind, liberated from irrational influence and from unreasonable dogma.